tonight. Look with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 12. Looks like we're coming to the end of Jeremiah. We're working our way to the end of Nehemiah. Jeremiah preceded what we're reading here in Nehemiah. He was pre-destruction of Jerusalem, and Nehemiah was afterward. But we can see how these stories all fit together. My text for this message is taken from verse 30 down through the end of the chapter, verse 47. And I want to speak with you about God's work of sanctification. That's a key word in Scripture. Redemption, justification, sanctification. Those are three words that are vital for us to understand, and sadly, much misunderstanding about them. Most people, when they hear the word sanctification, they think in terms of us being made holy. In other words, in our being, that somehow we're given a holy nature. You'll hear some people talking about a perfect nature that's given you, and therefore you're made holy in your person. But that's not what sanctification means. And with regard to being made holy, our holiness is by representation. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in us. This nature that is in us will not change. And this is the delusion that many have. I don't care what religion it is. If it's works religion, they always put you to doing and endeavoring and striving. And some to one degree or another, trying to beat this sin nature down and make yourself holier. And they, we're going to see it here in a little bit. They read those portions without holiness, it's impossible to see God. And so they're thinking, okay, I, got, I better get busy. There's nothing about this flesh that's ever going to be holy. The only thing that is going to deal with this flesh is to put it in the grave. But when we're talking about sanctification, the word literally means to be set apart unto holiness, which means it's not in ourselves. It's outside of ourselves. Where is that holiness? It's in Christ the representative. So that's the position of one who's been sanctified. It's in Christ. And I want you to see that in this particular portion of Scripture that we're looking at here, because after the walls had been finished, after the temple had been built, what we're looking at is that being a type of the work of Christ and his church. He finished the work. Nehemiah represents Christ in that position, Ezra, type of Christ. But after this was all done, here's where we read in verse 30 now, and the priests and the Levites did what? Purified themselves and purified the people. But it also says what? And the gates and the wall. Can you take gates and make them holy? Can you take a wall and make it holy? That's why I say sanctification is not about making anything holy in itself. It's still a wall. It's still a gate. And people are still people. And the Levites are still sinners. But here, the picture of them purifying themselves has to do with the law and what was required. And there, I would have you go back and look with me in Numbers chapter 8. When we're talking about redemption, when we're talking about justification, when we're talking about sanctification, it has to be in accord with God's law and justice. Otherwise, it's not redemption. Or it's not justification, it's not sanctification. And here in Numbers chapter 8, were the specific instructions given to the Levites as to how they were to enter into worship and the service of ministering before the Lord. Look in Numbers 8, beginning with verse 5. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Here again, is an understanding that if they needed cleansing, that means they were sinners. 
And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them, sprinkle water of purifying upon them, and let them shave all their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. There's the picture then of how they were to purify themselves that we see over here in verse 30. These Levites were then to be consecrated. That's really what that is about there. In fact, if you keep your place there in Numbers 8 and verse 12, none of this was without sacrifice. It mentions water and purified, but there's the shedding of blood. In verse 12, the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks, and thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. In the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices were an atonement. It was a covering. Christ, when he came, his death was an atonement. It wasn't a covering. It was putting away sin once for all. But here was the type and picture of how these were to be sanctified. That's really what this word means in verse 30, that they purified themselves. And the, today, because of the work of Christ on the cross, who are those who are wholly sanctified unto God and cleansed? See, there's the water that's represented and there's the shed blood that's represented. Well, that's describing the work of Christ. If you look over in Ephesians chapter 5, now when you read about the Levites as priests, what is Christ made of his people by his death? He's made unto God a kingdom of priests. So don't think of priests as being preachers. That's the way a lot of them interpret it. That's the, he's the priest. No. Any for whom Christ paid the debt that God chose, he has sanctified in Christ every believer, everyone for whom Christ paid the debt is a priest unto God. I'm here as a sheep among sheep, looking at the shepherd. I am here as a, an appointed priest unto God, just like any of you that are the Lord's. There's no difference. Men make a difference. That's where they get that distinguishing, that distinction between clergy and laymen. I've always wondered, well, because the, the word layman or people that means to be among the people clergy means to be above the people but that's not any hierarchy that you're going to find in scripture now, those that are the lord just like it says here in ephesians chapter 5 in verse 26 speaking of the work of christ on behalf of his church you see the language is similar to what we're reading about here these priests Concerning Christ, in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So in the Old Testament, it was the bullocks that were offered for the sin offering. Here, it's Christ. That was a type of Christ. But why? Verse 26, that he might sanctify and what? Cleanse it with the washing of the water. How? By the word. Who's the water? It's Christ. Who's the blood? It's Christ. How do we know it? By the word. Christ is the word. And therefore, that's how we approach. That's how we are sanctified under the Lord. It doesn't mean we stop being sinners. But because of the work of Christ, because of his perfection and his shed blood, those that he has redeemed are considered to be washed and the pure before him. That's the only way to come before God. In James chapter 4, if you look there, James chapter 4, it's verse 8, not verse 18, James 4, 8. Notice, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's just talking about how it is that Christ has established that peace, that relationship that any can ap approach unto God. And it's reciprocal, even as we're drawn to God, he draws nigh to us 
but says, in so doing, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Well, how is one to cleanse their hands? How is the one to have a purified heart other than in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ alone? And so the picture here of these priests and these Levites purifying themselves and the people being purified and the gates and the wall, it's showing how it is that these were to be sanctified or set apart unto God. It's through the blood shed and the washing of the water of the word. Both represent the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they purified themselves. They were set apart unto Christ and purified the people. In Hebrews chapter 9, there's just so many different portions of Scripture that come to mind here, but I want, if nothing else is retained, to know that what's described here, not only the need for sanctification, because we're talking about being sinners, but what is the work of sanctification? That's the second point. What is the work of sanctification? So here in Hebrews 9 and verse 14, Verse 13 says, If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. So that means in the Old Testament it was ceremony. It didn't actually make anybody righteous, nor did it actually put away sin. It was a type of the work of Christ. But now look at verse 14. How much more shall what? The blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. There it is. Purge your conscience. It's the same word to purify. Sanctify your conscience from what? Dead works to serve the living God. What that means is the work of sanctification by the blood of Christ sets the sinner apart to Christ. And it's his work that sanctifies. It's not the works of the flesh to be to be purged to purge your conscience means we never we don't give any thought to any works of our own that's purged that's done away because of the work of Christ and then again over in Hebrews chapter 12 that's what the writer of the Hebrews is all about showing how all of these ceremonies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 12 Here's the verse that a lot of people get hung up on. They think, oh, we better get busy. Because it says in verse 14, follow peace with all. The word men is an italic. So all regardless, follow peace. But what? And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And when they see that word holiness, all of a sudden they think, oh, that's something I got to do. Well, don't. Think in terms of that being something you do. It's in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word holiness, if you look it up in your concordance, take a strong concordance and look it up, it actually means a consecration or a purification. Same word as what we're looking here in the Old Testament. It's a sanctification. It's being set apart unto the Lord. And that's why we follow peace with all people looking to Christ as our holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's where the holiness is. It's in Christ. It's not in us. And so other portions of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. I know I'm having you look up a number, but I want us to see here what is the... We've seen the need for sanctification. That's because we're sinners. And we need the work of another. That's in the person of Christ. But that's the work of sanctification is to be set apart in him. Peter wrote about it here in 1 Peter chapter 1. And verses, verse 2. Notice he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So that's who is addressed in sanctification. It is the elect of God. And we see that word foreknowledge. It's not God knowing ahead of time who would believe on him. That's how foreknowledge is often misinterpreted. Foreknowledge is God knowing beforehand 
who he would choose. That's his foreknowledge of who he would choose and who he would sanctify and set apart in Christ. So you've got elect according to the knowledge of God the Father, foreknowledge of God the Father. Notice, through sanctification of the Spirit. How does the Spirit sanctify the sinner? It's not by giving him a perfect nature. None of us have. If you're going to tell me tonight that, hey, I'm one of those, I've been sanctified, I have a perfect nature, I'd like to know when that has ever been manifest. Because you have just as much sinful thoughts now. In fact, if you're honest, probably since the work of the Spirit in the heart, you have more sinful thoughts now than you ever knew about. Because it's the Spirit that brings home the light to show you there's no good in this flesh. Paul said that. So the sanctification of the Spirit here is the work of the Spirit. Notice here, there's Father, Son, and Spirit. The Spirit's work is to sanctify or to set apart unto God those that He has chosen. But how does He do it? There's... Now, the third thing, it says, unto obedience and sprinkling of what? The blood of Jesus Christ. Now, there again, don't think that's your obedience. That's how some people interpret it. Just like that word holiness in Hebrews. They're thinking, well, that's something I know. It's unto the obedience and sprinkling of what? The blood of Jesus Christ. It's his obedience unto death that is our sanctification. Like Paul wrote there to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.30, who of, it, of him is made unto us, what? Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So that's the work of sanctification. And again, coming back here to my text, when it talks about not only the priests, the people, but as I said, the gates and the wall, that ought to tell you right there, it doesn't have anything to do with that nature changing. Nature of a wall is still a wall. A gate's still a gate. A sinner's still a sinner. But we're what? Accepted in the beloved. That's how the work of sanctification is accomplished. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you're probably thinking, well, he's stuck on one verse there. He's never going to get done. Now we're going to speed up. Because verses 31 to 43, we can sum up under this head. And that is, what is the praise of those who have been sanctified? How are they distinguished? It's not by some personal obedience, a holy lot, no. It's the praise of their lips that comes from a heart that has been transformed by the grace of God, given life to look to Christ and Christ alone. And that's what we see here in verse 31. Then I brought up the princes of Judah upon the wall. Again, Nehemiah represents Christ, I brought them up. He's the one that leads them, directs them. My sheep hear my voice. And appointed two great companies of them that gave thanks, whereof one went on the right hand upon the wall toward the dung gate. And after them went Hosiah and half the princes of Judah and Azariah, Ezra and Meshulam, Judah and Benjamin and Shemaiah and Jeremiah. And certain of the priests' sons with trumpets, namely Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Madaniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachar, the son of Asaph, and his brethren, Shemaiah and Azarim, Milali, uh, Gilali, Mai, Nathaniel, and Judah, Hanani, and the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe, before them. I believe in those three. There's Nehemiah leading them. Then they were musical instruments of David. And then Ezra. You see a picture of prophet, priest, and king. And those three persons that are represented there. And at the fountain gate, which was over against them, they went up by the, the stairs of the city of David at the going up of the wall above the house of David, even to the water gate eastward. Remember, we were studying how all these gates were built counterclockwise. Well, now he's got people marching in that same direction, exactly as the, the gates had been placed. And the other company of them, there were two companies, two choirs, if you will, 
that gave thanks went over against them, and I after them, and, and the half of the people upon the wall from beyond the tower of the furnaces, even of the broad wall, and from above the gate of Ephraim, and above the old gate, and above the fish gate, and the tower of Hananiel, and the tower of Mia, even under the sheep gate, and they stood still in the prison gate. Remember how we saw when we were studying that, every one of those gates was a picture of Christ, the gate, and how he directed the people through those gates. So stood the two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of God, and I and the half of the rulers with me, and the priests, Eliakim, Masiah, Min, Mina, Amin, Micaiah, Elioni, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets, and Messiah, and Shemaiah, and Eleazar, and Uzi, and Jehoianan, and Malkijah, and Elam, and Ezer. Look at this right here. And the singers sang loud. I love that. This was a declaration for all to hear with Jezariah, their overseer. What a beautiful picture here, I believe, again, of the praise of those who are sanctified. They were set apart for this worship of the Lord. And now, having been set apart, all the more reason for them to praise and worship God through the sacrifices, the type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that what true praise and worship is? The strong element of all of this is what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I trust that when we finish hearing a message that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what it produces in the heart. Thanksgiving. Notice the singers sang loudly. We're kind of timid, I think, sometimes <laughs> in singing. But it's to be heard. God's to be glorified, even through our singing. And the emphasis, even though it mentions David's instruments there, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis on the words. The word being sung. That's how it's put over there in Colossians chapter 3. If you look in verse 16, this is how we're instructed. In verse 16, let the word of Christ well in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's what true worship is about. These songs that I select for us to sing, they go in conjunction with the very message of Christ and his work accomplished on behalf of sinners such as we are. And it's a time of instruction. We're not singing just to fill time. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You can never get to the bottom of it. And even if you do on one song, and it's going to pick up on another. That's how we're to instruct, instruct one another. But it's this is the Lord who made them rejoice with great joy. It was God who had brought them back. It was God who had drawn them. It was God who had consecrated them, set them apart. And therefore the praise of those who are sanctified. It even says there that the women and the children, see in verse 43, the wives also and the children rejoiced. I love it even in our congregation. Some have mentioned it that aren't here, but on Sunday when we've got the little kids singing, there's I love how some just belt it out. You can hear their voice coming up above everybody else. That's a beautiful sound. To know that even at a young age, the Lord is being pleased to cause some of these to, to cry out unto him. So that's the praise of those who are sanctified. And then verses 44 to 47, this is where we see the life of sanctification. How it is those that are sanctified live. It says, and at that time were some appointed over the chambers for the treasures, for the offerings, for the first fruits, and for the tithes. To gather into them out of the fields of the cities the portions of the law for the priests and Levites for Judah rejoiced for the priests and for the Levites that waited. And both the singers and the porters kept the ward of their God and the ward of the purification according to the commandment of David and of Solomon his son. As in the days of David and Asaph of old there were chief 
of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving unto God. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel, he's the one the Lord raised up to build the temple, and in the days of Nehemiah, again the Lord raised up to build the wall, gave the portions of the singers and the porters every day his portion, and they what? Sanctified holy things unto the Levites, and the Levites sanctified them unto the children of Aaron. Well, that's what it is to live a life of sanctification, particularly as believer priests, because that's who's described here. What was their one life and ministry? They didn't have any land of their own. It was wholly dedicated to the service of the temple. What's our life as believer priests? Wholly dedicated to Christ, who is the temple. And uh, everything about us. It says some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouses for, for the offerings. And some were appointed over the, 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 the first fruits and the, the offerings that were being brought in. Some were appointed as singers that sang while the sacrifices were being offered. Some were gatekeepers that kept the charge of their God as it says there, in the charge of their purification. Well, again, in verse 47, they sanctified holy things. Well, if it's already holy, it doesn't mean then that you're making it any holier. What it is is acknowledging these things that God himself had set apart as a type of his holiness and righteousness. And therefore, they were consecrated and set apart unto him. It's like Christ taught his disciples to pray, and that's the true disciples prayer people call it the lord's prayer but it's disciples prayer when he said our father which art in heaven what hallowed be thy name that word hallowed means sanctified well you're not to make god any holier than what he is that's not the, the sense of the word sanctified but it's acknowledging who he is in his holiness and righteousness and also as sinners as priests all this was through the sacrifices being offered to the temple but as believer priests, acknowledging none other than Christ as being our sanctification, our righteousness, our holiness, our justification before him. It's being wholly separated unto Christ. So that's living a life of sanctification. It's not me being perfect. No, I, in fact, the closer you get to the light, the more you see your own wretchedness. But it is being wholly sanctified unto the Lord. If we have anything to say, he gets the glory. It's not anything in us. Unto him alone be all the glory. Well, I pray the Lord will bless that as we've heard his word. Being a sanctified sinner. That means our perfections in Christ is what that means, not in us. All right.